So to start our journey into artificial intelligence, one of the things we're going to first start to talk about is sort of this idea of, say, an agent and its environment. Now, the entire idea to an environment for just a second is, again, if you think about like the world for a second, right, there are, you know, trees, uh, here's my bad attempt at an animal, animal, animals, and then, you know, in our case, people. And so each one of these types of things that are going on in the environment have to be interacted with or potentially can be interacted with by sort of our agent. And so as we're starting to think about this, we can treat this as if we call it an architecture. Now, the entire idea to this is that the agent is receiving sort of updates about the environment as it's happening. So, you know, again, if we're thinking about it from that sort of real world perspective of, say, for example, a tree, again, I now my agent knows that the tree is sort of in the area. However, it can also change. So if we're playing a simple game of tic-tac-toe, that's still an environment. And so when the environment changes, say for example, I place an X in the center here, again, those updates are needing to be received by the agent. And we call these, just to use some super fancy uh, $5 words, precepts. Again, the entire idea is that the agent, based on what types of sensors it's receiving or it has in sort of uh, installed or configured uh, on it, those are reading in those precepts of the environment and doing something known as the agent's function. Now, agent function, it can also be sort of referred to as an objective function. You'll see that a lot in linear algebra, for example. But the big, more important thing is, again, this is sort of the brain portion of our agent. It's thinking about what to do. Again, if it saw, just to use that tic-tac-toe example again, if it saw sort of the X was in the middle, what should it do? Or if it's, uh, I don't know, you're, you're building an agent for Minecraft uh, and you see a tree, you know, you punch the tree. Each one of those decisions, either, again, tic-tac-toe or punching trees, that gets fed into what we would call the actuator. So, again, uh, if we're working off of the tic-tac-toe board, you know, we don't really have, like, a physical representation of the agent. But, again, it says, oh, well, you know, processing the inputs that I see, the X in the middle, I want to place the O, my turn, say, in the corner. Versus, again, if we play the sort of Minecraft kind of card, again, we see that tree, and here's Steve. He would have a square head. Go punch the tree. Again, each one of those activators are being fed back into the environment because again, as you can imagine it, they have the up the environment has to update. Again, when I placed or when the agent placed the O into sort of the environment, the environment changed. If Steve keeps punching that tree, the tree is going to give it uh, give him wood all of a sudden. And the same kind of thing can happen as we start to sort of play around with at least a little bit of foreshadowing into problem set 01. Again, we're going to be working off of a self-cleaning robot. And so that same kind of concepts going on, but rather than in a three-dimensional world, it's almost very similar to what we were seeing with the crossword or the, the connect uh, tic-tac-toe sort of drawing I showed a second ago. It's going to be working off of a... 2D uh, tile screen. And again, when we think about this, our agent, for example, is working off of its own sensors. Something like a camera, for example, could be telling us our agent, if we're thinking about this from a top-down sort of design, there we are. If we think about that as a top-down design, you know, maybe the agent can see above it to the left and right of it and below it. Or 
if you're thinking about this maybe from a different perspective, uh, some of the more modern uh, video game styles, they design out, well, this agent sort of has a direction associated to it, and I'm just trying to draw that in nicely. And again, since our agent is facing downward, it would have, say, have a field of view. So instead of seeing you know, things behind it, Wherever those eyes are facing, again, that's where you would project out sort of how many tiles it can see forward. And the way that we can also think about this again, if we start to uh, play sort of the, the thinking uh, game, what else could an agent have? Something like an antenna, for example, if it's communicating with other uh, agents that are in the environment, again, sending and receiving signals about what the other agents are perceiving around the environment. So again, if we're thinking about it from problem set one's perspective, what we're going to be focusing on is this idea of, well, you can make your agent move up, down, left, or right. And you can perceive up, down, left, and right. Well, in our case, if we're thinking about this, uh, you know, the agent sees to the right of it a dirty tile. Oh, well, then when the agent sort of makes the decision to move to the right, it's the actuators sort of making our action of go to the tile. In this case, you can see, oh, well, the agent is also deciding I need to clean the tile. So what happens with this is, again, if we think about sort of our agent was right here and here's where that dirty tile was our agent moved to that uh dirty tile and just to say it's still dirty and then one final one the agent cleaned it each one of these actions so move right clean these could be stored as again what we consider the complete history of our agent or the precept history. In our simple example, you know, again, maybe there was a dirty tile up here as well. And as the environment updated, again, maybe I want my agent to know, hey, there was a, a dirty tile that you didn't touch quite yet. Well, that helps us decide what maybe to do in our next action. And so the same kind of concept can come in here. This is where, you know, you start to bleed in a little bit of your computer science background. But in essence, what you could uh, think about is this is just a, that's not how you spell else. <laughs> this is a simple else if chained conditional statement. If, else, else do nothing. And so again, if we think about those precepts, well, I have a conditional. If my agent is at A1 and A1 is currently a clean tile, then what should I do? All right, well, very simple. Move to the right. Now, uh, as you can sort of see here, I'm using a very, very condensed version. So this is a two by one environment. There's only two tiles, A1 and B1. But again, all right, well, if I see that my tile is clean, let me move to the right just to go see if it's dirty. If, however, A1 had been dirty, oh, well, again, if we think about, you know, Here's that same dirt pile uh, or that oil slick or whatever we've got in that space. Hey, our agent sees it. Clean this tile. Same kind of thing. Again, if it's now we've moved our agent over to be one. If it sees that that's a dirty tile, clean it. If it's not a dirty tile, move it right on back over to A1. And you can sort of see it's almost very similar to a finite state machine where it's just sort of backing for, you know, going back and forth between these two tiles. Again, we can expand this because as you can imagine, I could have either something like the entire history. If I'm sort of recording what was the environment sort of one step before or two steps before or 10 steps before, again, that allows me to maybe make decisions. If, 
we're thinking about this again from the Minecraft sort of example. Uh, I saw that I punched wood. I, you know, tore down the tree. I now have wood. And that's all of sort of the history of my agent's actions. So I can assume, oh, well, since I have wood, I can make a crafting table and a house or tools and things of that nature. And that starts to get us into what we would call sort of our performance measures. Essentially, we're trying to evaluate how good is my agent. Now, as you can clearly see from sort of the slides, there is no universal measure that decides these types of things. Again, a tic-tac-toe playing agent versus a self-cleaning robot agent versus uh, a Minecraft playing agent. Each one of those are going to act and behave differently, and they're going to have different goals associated to them. You know, again, if we're thinking about tic-tac-toe, uh, we would want number of wins. We would want to try and ensure that we are always winning. If we are thinking about it by, say, the cleaning robot, cleaning robot, maybe it's number of tiles cleaned. And then if we're thinking about it from our Minecraft perspective, as you can see, I teach, I do not, uh, I do not have uh, an art background, but I don't know, uh, end game, don't you have to kill like a dragon in it? I don't, my point being is again, each one of these have different performance measures. And so you're not going to have sort of one solid thing. And that's actually where we have to kind of be a little mindful because think about the fact that I said, oh, number of tiles cleaned for my agent. Well, if my agent happened to have an ability like uh, drop stuff or drop uh, collection, again, if we're thinking about an agent, you know, it's got to clean. What does cleaning mean? It means, oh, you know, here's all the waste. I'm collecting it into maybe a bin. If it has to go unload that stuff later on, well, if our performance measure was just simply number of tiles cleaned, what's stopping it from dropping off all of the stuff back onto, in this case, B1, uh, and then going back over and cleaning it? Because it can just repeat that process, and it's technically doing a good job. But that's actually where we start to get into a little bit of what we would, I, I'm calling sort of rationality versus omniscience. You know, again, when we're thinking about designing out agents, especially more real context, not drawings on a, a picture uh, or on a PowerPoint, you know, again, we're not, we're only looking to sort of work off of the expected outcomes. Again, if I'm walking, if I have an agent, uh, a self-driving car or food delivery uh, agent, again, I see a crosswalk coming in, I have to make some decisions. And I'm going to plan, oh, well, you know, there may be a pedestrian walking through, or in this case, a pedestrian is uh, or again, if we're thinking about it uh, as a food delivery agent, uh, you know, again, has to make sure it can cross the road before it crosses the road. But what that means is we don't account for everything. You're not going to see a whale and a petunia falling out of the sky. And if you get that reference, thank you for reading a book. Uh, you're never going to see this, right? You're never going to plan for this. You're never going to have this in your evaluations. But that's sort of the, the, that is what I would call, you have to limit it is what I'm, I'm getting at here. You, you want to plan for as much as you can, but you don't need to plan for literally anything uh, as minimal probability sort of stakes. What this sort of turns into is sort of as we start to design out agents, we want to create or plan out sort of its P's, you know, performance measure, environment, actuators, and sensors. Again, if we're thinking about this from sort of the hot topic, autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles, what I've got here on the slide, again, what we're looking at is, all right, well, if I'm designing out a self-driving vehicle agent, what would be some of the performance measures that I would be looking for? Okay, you know, I, I wanted to, uh, let's see, be safe. Uh, again, if I'm thinking about a vehicle, it has sort of uh, 
if we're dealing with a two-lane road and here's my agent, I don't want it veering into the other uh, sort of lane. Same kind of concept. You can see that that's sort of what legal's sort of getting at there. Uh, and if you know, I'm playing around with something like maybe this is a, a, a self-driving vehicle for uh, somewhere like Uber, right? Uh, oh, all right. Well, you know, again, looking to hopefully maximize the profits. We'll deal with, you know, people wanting to get into a self-driving Uber later, but that's a, another little thing. What we then get into is, again, all of these different performance measures are sort of things that you can do to evaluate whether or not your agent is a good agent. And then you also have sort of the environment. And again, we're not thinking about the environment as literally the world that it exists in, but what are some of the different aspects that the agent may have to encounter and interact with? So again, if we're thinking about this, the environment for a self-driving car is the road, but that more specifically, if we're thinking about it, on like a highway perspective, that's something like lanes. And then there's other traffic. So again, there's uh, a car going this direction. If this was a four lane road, you know, maybe there's a car over here and a car over here as well. So again, each one of those types of things are elements that our agent would have to kind of deal with. Pedestrians, again, if we're looking at the bull petunia example, same kind of opposite. Then we've got the actuators. Again, if we're designing out our agent, what types of sort of methods are the uh, is the agent going to have to manipulate the environment or interact with the environment? Self-driving car, again, we're looking at it from the perspective of, oh, well, you know, gas needs to be pushed into the uh, engine, or if you've got an electric vehicle, you know, again, you got a signal to simply go forward. Or, in this case, rotate. Again, if we're thinking about sort of, uh, here's a little turn that our road does, we need the agent to be able to rotate the vehicle uh, in some direction. Same kind of concept, if a car is coming around it or ahead of it, We'd need to be able to slow that down. Maybe some other types of actuators, again, on this idea of, you know, letting other people know, uh, horn for whatever reason, uh, either way. And then the final one, as you can see, is how is the agent interact or perceiving the environment? Now, this is where obviously you're getting into a very big kind of spectrum because, you know, self-driving cars is very dangerous. So you've got almost every sensor out the wazoo. So you've got things like cameras, LIDAR, speedometers, GPS, all these nuts and bolts are being fed in to make sure that this thing doesn't crash into people. But that's actually where I'll use a different example. Now, rather than self-driving car, wheels, you know, giant death machine type of thing, another place that we've seen sort of artificial intelligence being used is antenna design. So this link, automated antenna design with evolutionary algorithms, uh, was actually done by NASA uh, a little over 15 years ago. And the entire idea here was, well, you know, it's kind of expensive to send uh, satellites out into space. So it's really hard to kind of test these things out there. What if we used an AI agent to sort of simulate and make better decisions about how, you know, what they were calling sort of novel designs? What kind of antenna designs can work and still maximize and what they were considering, again, this is taken from sort of the paper, uh, things like maximize beam width, maximize impedance. I'm a computer scientist, so I'm not going to act like I know those words. But the same kind of concept can come in. Well, one of the things was, again, if it's going into space, there's a lot of calculations. So things like its weight and size needed to be accounted for because those throw off the calculations if we're exceeding them. Okay, well, again, that's the performance measures to measure whether or not the design of this antenna was a good idea. So what are the in, what are elements of the environment that the agent would need to be working off of? Again, not a 
whatever science, not a rocket scientist. Uh, but you could think, all right, well, you know, there's things like uh, radio frequencies that the antenna will have to interact with. There's another uh, satellite and another antenna that it needs to be communicating with. So these are things that, again, the agent needs to be working around. And that's actually where we get into sort of the actuators. So when we're thinking about sort of the design of this little picture right here. Again, if we think about it, actuators here were the actual antenna design, not the satellite, but like designing out the antenna. And so going through the paper, you can see that they actually were sort of extruding out that antenna wire. And it had sort of two, four, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, activities. Forward, rotate X, rotate Y, and rotate Z. So the entire purpose uh, of each one of those is as the wire is sort of going out, right, do I rotate my direction? Do I rotate my, let me change colors here. Do I, let's see, red. Do I rotate my agent or rotate sort of the direction of the next uh, wire? Uh, in this case, it said, oh, you know, rotate this direction, rotate X, Y, and Z to this sort of angle, and then move forward this many centimeters or millimeters. Let me redraw that line. There. And then, as you can sort of see from this sort of little spot, you know, again, make that same, where do we rotate? Then make that same kind of forward motion, where do we rotate forward, 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 and that's where, in this case, it ended. Again, each one of those was an actuator. Which servo motor or which arm do you sort of deploy and enact uh, at this stage in sort of your design? And then you've got, obviously, the next little bit here. Let me change my color back since it's a red. The idea of, again, what it was considering, it's sensors. And so you've got things like voltage standing wave ratio, the gain values of sort of the receive and transmission frequencies. Again, maintaining uh, uh, the uptime of a particular radio frequency and then, you know, making sure that you have good uh, signal strength with your antenna uh, and, you know, your connecting uh, satellite as well. So with that, to kind of give you a, a, a little thinking activity, let's imagine, uh, for our sake, I have a, a self-gardening robot, you know, I have a bunch of, this is the worst design, I have a bunch of uh, fruit on a plant. Let's call it a tomato plant, because, yeah. All right, with that in mind, and you know, the comments or just thinking about this by yourself, again, what would be the performance measures of a self-gardening agent that wants to harvest tomatoes? What kind of environment is that going to be working uh, out of or kind of have to interact with? What are the actuators, again, for harvesting these tomatoes? And what kind of sensors would that agent need to have? For our sake, again, if you're thinking about it, don't throw the book at it with sensors. Don't just copy and paste what you saw from the self-driving car. You don't need LiDAR for uh, this, I don't think. Um, but again, what would be a sensor that you would perceive or would want uh, out of your agent to make sure that you're harvesting tomatoes?